<laughs> and there's Pat Silas. So thank you all for being here. And again, sorry if we're not saying all the names, but I think we should start, shall we, James? Start to turn sure. towards. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so we're so grateful. I guess now we're gonna be the big heads on your screen for a bit. <laughs> We're so grateful to get to be here with you in this way tonight, and we hope that it is nourishing. We hope that it's a little bit of time outside of time when you can just really connect with yourself and each other a bit. And I'm happy to just kind of bring in also our first reader who I'm, or presenter, who I am very excited to welcome. And that is Kim Rosen. And our intros are gonna be very simple and personal because we know you can all read our bios, get all that hard information uh, off the website if you like. But I just wanna say a few things I wrote down about Kim. If anyone can weave a web of magic, it's Kim Rosen. I remember the first time I witnessed her reciting poetry I think it was a good decade or so ago in Santa Cruz. It was at the Cayuga Vault, I remember. Me too. And I remember that? <laughs> and I just thought, this is how it's done. This is how you get poetry into people's bloodstream. This is how it's done. I'd never seen anything like it. And her presence, just her presence itself invited me into a deeper experience, even of poems that I already knew. And I felt as though I had not quite heard them before. Alchemy is a word that comes to mind. And then later I learned of the work that she does in Africa, helping young Kenyan women receive an education and the hope of fulfilling their dreams. And if you want to know more about that, please look up the She Fund. S-H-E with the punto in between <laughs> each letter, because uh, she does magic there as well. So please join us with all of that said in welcoming Kim Rosen. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Danusha. And I will not forget that uh, performance that Jamie Sieber and I gave at um, Cayuga Vault uh, in Santa Cruz, and it was followed by a workshop at the end of which Danusha said to me something that I quote, in every workshop, um, poet that she is, I, I recognized her even though I didn't know her before that as, as a poet that was gonna resonate the string of my soul. Um, she said, ah, mus the music is like an enzyme that delivers the poetry. So what I wanna say about what I offer is not all poetry sits easily or appropriately in music, but some poetry seems to love it. And uh, I, have, I have, my passion has been learning poems by heart that have become uh, prayers for me, uh, ecumenical, non-denominational prayers or spells, which is what we did when we were Homo ergaster 1.8 million years ago, and the first poetic words emerged from our throats, um, which were the first words that existed, uh, as I understand it, historically, uh, it was poetry, and it was because we had to go somewhere beyond the surface. There was something had to be uttered that couldn't be uttered in a matter-of-fact, linear way. And so I welcome all of us to this hearth here that um, James and Danusha, I've, I've had the experience of being with them in other uh, seminars, and they create hearth and warmth around them and openness. And uh, it's my hope and honor to invoke us. Uh, you can hear the, the, the coyotes are singing outside the window. You may hear them. They're actually really yelling. So, wow. I don't know if you can hear that. Um, they want to be here too at the hearth. And uh, so it's my honor to uh, offer an invocational series of poems, uh, not by me, but by poets who are 
members of my composite guru who have written poems, as have every one of the po poets um, who are here today to read their own work, written poems that use my mind to unlock my mind, that burst me open into that human communion that can only happen when we go beyond the mind, almost inadvertently because of a line of a poetry that goes, <gasps> So I wanted to begin unexpectedly, but uh, it wasn't part of my plan, but I want to begin by calling in uh, Robert Bly, who died, I don't know if, it, within a week, a week ago perhaps. Um, he has had a huge impact on me and I know on many, many of us. And for me, it's particularly his um, translations. And so I'm going to call us in with this poem that for me is very appropriate. And then I will move into several poems by poets I know and love and poems that you may recognize and love. And I'll tell you their names and the poets' names and also the musicians' names when I have completed the um, journey of it. But let me begin with a poem which was originally written by Kabir, and Robert Bly calls it a version that he created of this poem by Kabir. And it says, I talk to my inner lover, and I say, why such a rush? We could just pause there. I talk to my inner lover. I say, why such a rush? We know there is some sort of spirit that loves the birds and the animals, and the ants. Probably the same one that gave radiance to you in your mother's womb. Is it possible you would be walking around entirely orphaned now? The truth is, you turned away yourself and decided to go into the dark alone. And now you are tangled up in others and have forgotten what you once knew. And that's why everything you do has some weird failure. I talk to my inner lover and I say, why such a rush? We know there is some sort of spirit that loves the birds and the animals and the ants. Probably the same one that gave radiance to you in your mother's womb. Is it possible you would be walking around entirely orphaned now? The truth is, you turned away yourself and decided to go into the dark alone. And now you are tangled up in others and have forgotten what you once knew. And that's why everything you do has some weird failure in it. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things, feel the future dissolve in a moment, like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go before you know how desolate the landscape can be between regions of kindness. How you ride and ride, thinking the bus will never stop. The passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out the window forever. Before you know the tender gravity of kindness. You must travel to where the Indian 
in a white poncho lies dead at the side of the road. You must see how this could be you. How he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing inside. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows. And you see the size of the cloth. And then it's only kindness that makes sense anymore. Only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to mail letters or gaze at bread. Only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for. And then goes with you everywhere, like a shadow or a friend. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing inside. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it's only kindness that makes sense anymore. Only kindness that ties your shoes, sends you out into the day to mail letters or gaze at bread. Only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for. And then goes with you everywhere, like a shadow or a friend. The thing is to love life even when you have no stomach for it. When everything you've held dear crumbles like burnt paper in your hands, your throat filled with the silt of it. When grief sits with you It's tropical heat thickening the air, heavy as water, more fit for gills than lungs. When grief weights you down like your own flesh, only more of it, an obesity of grief. And you say, how can a body withstand this? Then you hold life like a face between your palms, a plain face, no charming smile, no violent eyes, and you say, I will take you. I will love you again. the light that came to Lucille Clifton came in a shift of knowing when 
Even her fondest sureties faded away. It was the summer she understood she had not understood and was not mistress even of her own off eye. Then the man escaped, throwing away his tie, and the children grew legs and started walking, and she could see the peril of an unexamined life. She shut her eyes, afraid to look for her authenticity. But the light insists on itself in the world, and a voice from the non-dead past started talking. She shut her ears, and it spelled out into her hand. You might as well open the door, my child. The truth is furiously knocking. It was the summer she understood she had not understood and was not mistress even of her own off eye. Then the man escaped, throwing away his tie, and the children grew legs and started walking, and she could see the peril of an unexamined life. She shut her eyes, afraid to look for her authenticity, but the light insists on itself in the world, and a voice from the non-dead past started talking. She shut her ears, and it spelled out into her hands. You might as well open the door, my child. The truth is furiously knocking. It's a poem by Kabir, version by Robert Bly, followed by Kindness by Naomi Shihab Nye, which I speak in honor of James's upcoming anthology, and uh, followed by The Thing Is by Ellen Bass, and the last poem is called The Light That Came to Lucille Clifton by Lucille Clifton, and the first piece of music was by Jamie Sieber called Benediction. The second piece by Kai Engel called Idea. Thank you so much. It's a joy to be with you. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kim. Just See what I mean, everyone. <laughs> See what I mean. <laughs> I could have just stayed soaking in that bath all evening. So thank you so much for bringing that real magic to us. And um, Carol, are we both? Uh, can we bring on James as well? Um, he should oh, be. On. There he is. Okay. Yeah. I was on a funny screen. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you so much. And okay, somehow we need to carry on, right, James? Right. Maybe we can just take a moment and really absorb that. I, I love your description of it as, as being like a bath. It's just something that you really soak in. Yeah. Yeah. What a gift. So thank you, everyone, for receiving that as well. And we're going to read a little bit back and forth, James and I, and then we get to share with you more of these wonderful presenters that were so, and poets and presenters were so excited are with us tonight. We're so excited to have Michael Cleaver Diggs read you some of his amazing work after we read, and then Jane Hirschfield. So you're just really obviously in for such a treat. And uh, James, shall we introduce each other? I have a little intro of you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. I'll intro you, and then you can read a thing, and then we'll reverse that. Sounds That's good. Okay. We're just so used to doing things together. 
but you know, here we are, which relates to my intro. So I will read what I've got here. What can I say about James? First of all, he's definitely my brother from another mother. <laughs> I can't even imagine these past two years without our connection and collaboration. Secondly, James is both a poet in his own right and a fine harvester of poems. His collections are sustenance, a curation of delight and encouragement for many. He's also just pure heart and a genuine presence. I'm so lucky to get to work with him, savor his poems and call him a friend. So please join me in welcoming James Cruz. Oh, thank you so much. Mm. So sweet. Uh, Danush and I often joke that we end up in tears uh, when we're working together. There's usually a lot of laughter and then a lot of tears. Um, so you're already bringing me really close to the tears um, <laughs> and the joy too. But uh, so so I'll I'll share what I have for you and um, and it's it's a very similar reflection actually. So. It's hard to imagine a time when I didn't know the poems of Danusha Lamaris. I feel like each one has become a guidepost for me in my own life. And as I've shared with some folks in our webinar before and with Danusha herself, several of her poems once graced the walls of my apartment in Providence, Rhode Island. <laughs> Before I had any art to put up, I was putting up cherries, inshallah, from her wonderful first book, The Moons of August. And as I was stirring lentils on the stove or sitting in my chair on a winter day, looking up, taking in her words, steeping in what she had to say. Mm -hmm. And I had the privilege of being able to share her poem, Small Kindnesses, in my first anthology, and we'll have the privilege again of sharing it in this newest anthology, because I feel that this poem is one that we all need in our lives. And, and the sentiments behind it, I can say, are, are pretty reflective of who Danusha is as a person, valuing kindness and heart every step of the way. So I'm so grateful to you um, for oh. being my collaborator and uh, so glad to be here with all of you. Yeah, thank you so much, James. That was so tender and sweet. And I'd love to hear you read a poem. Absolutely. So the first poem that I'd like to read um, was actually taken from a Mary Oliver quote. Um, a lot of you probably know um, this Mary Oliver uh, quote, and she says, when it's over, I want to say that all my life, I was a bride married to amazement. I was the bridegroom taking the world into my arms. And I love that she says she's both bride and bridegroom. Um, but beyond that, I, I love that quote because I feel like it's so easy to lose that sense of awe and wonder for the everyday world, especially with everything else going on. And I feel lucky to have uh, many teachers uh, for holding on to that wonder. Danusha is one of them. My husband, Brad, is another. And uh, so this one is about him and being in some ways literally married to amazement. The man I married sat next to me after our wedding. October light pouring in over dusty pews as he loosened his tie and sipped from a cup of apple cider, closing his eyes to savor the taste. Now I think I didn't marry him so much as his amazement for the everyday, the way he still gasps each time we see something new. Baby painted turtle plodding through a stream in the quarry, or a neon orange caterpillar inching across crisp leaves on the trail, how he kneels to film it from every angle, while I crouch beside him in awe of his awe, learning 
all that I can. In awe of his awe. I love that too. <laughs> Thank you. That painted turtle. That husband. Yeah, he really does audibly gasp every time he's <laughs> amazed by something. It's so adorable. I know he would be embarrassed to hear me say this right now, but it's true. <laughs> well, you get to say whatever you want when he's not here. <laughs> Those are the rules. <laughs> right. I, right. I remember taking a child to see the ocean for the first time. And I didn't realize until we almost got to the ocean that she had never seen it. Mm. Growing up in Fresno, and not having left Fresno. And as soon as she was in the back seat of the car, and as soon as we rounded the curve where you could glimpse, she just went, oh! and I can still feel the goosebumps I got from hearing her exclamation of joy, you know, mm. oh, ocean. It brought me back to what would that be to not even have seen it, you know, that original moment. So, anyway, I'll read a short poem. I like to start with a little poem to get my poetry legs. And uh, I think sometimes I write things to assure myself or remind myself, I guess that's what we do. What begins? What begins in beauty ends in beauty. What begins in sorrow ends in sorrow. The seed once planted soon in full bloom. If grief, then grief. If anger, anger. They say the first week of any love affair reveals its end. Give me the child at seven and so forth. And didn't the world begin with a bang? Hard to argue for another truth. But I have seen a heart worn thin take to small repairs have watched a blue jay born wild eat out of a woman's hand. And didn't we begin as tadpoles curled and gilled? I want to think the starting place is only one location on a curve that we can follow to another end and then begin again. Mm. Gorgeous, I love that. The, the heart-worn thin taking to small repairs. That's, that's really beautiful. So true, too. Hmm. Read us another one. Yeah, I'm just deciding which one I'm going to share. Oh, well, you like me. <laughs> we like, James and I like to not know things. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a favorite state that we just, we don't know what we're going to do next. It's true, it's true. Um, I love the not knowing and the mystery, but I think um, I think I do have the poem I want to share. And um, and this one was written early on in the pandemic when perhaps um, throughout the pandemic, a lot of us had to learn more about self-care and, and get in touch with that as, as things got really difficult. So this one is called simply self-care. Some days it feels like a foreign language. I'm asked to practice with new words for happiness, work, and love. I'm still learning how to say a cup of tea for no reason, what to call the extra honey I drizzle in, how to label the relentless urge to do more and more as useless, and how to translate the heart's pounding message when it comes, enough, enough. This morning, I search for words to capture the glimmering sun as it lifts above the mountains, clouds already closing in as fat droplets of rain darken the deck. I'm learning to call this stillness self-care too, just standing here as gold finches scatter up from around the feeder like broken pieces of bright yellow stained glass reassembling in the sheltering arms of a maple. Thank you. Those broken pieces. Mm. I saw one of those today 
in our persimmon tree and it always just feels so startling. We're not yeah. used to birds having that kind of color uh, in this part of the world. So yeah, the surprise of that. Thank you, James. I, yeah. I'm going to read one of the poems you mentioned since you mentioned it. It also wasn't on my playlist, but I'll read the poem, Inshallah, that I wrote years ago. Um, actually, I wrote this poem while waiting to see if Naomi Nye had chosen my first book. I heard that it was on her short in her short pile, you know, and I hadn't ever had a book out, and I thought, oh, I hope she likes it. And um, and then I went under a sat under a tree, an apple tree here in the field, and I wrote this poem. I remember that story, and you know, I love I love reading it and thinking about you waiting to know, like you know, is my book getting picked? Am I going to win this award? And I love the idea of writing a poem to invoke hope for yourself. <laughs> And then when she did, you know, take it, I said, can I put this poem in there? <laughs> and she approved it. So it was just a nice loop. And it's certainly about waiting for much more uh, significant things than to see if, you know, a book is happening or not. But that's what spurred it, was from thinking about that state of expectation and how I don't like it. <laughs> anyway, um, inshallah. I don't know when it slipped into my speech. That soft word meaning, if God wills it. Inshallah, I will see you next summer. The baby will come in spring. Inshallah. Inshallah, this year we will have enough rain. So many plans I've laid have unraveled easily as braids beneath my mother's quick fingers. Every language must have a word for this. A word our grandmothers uttered under their breath as they pinned the whites soaked in lemon, hung them to dry in the sun, or peeled potatoes dropping the discarded skins into a bowl. Our sons will return next month, inshallah. Inshallah, this war will end soon. Inshallah, the rice will be enough to last through winter. How lightly we learn to hold hope, as if it were an animal that could turn around and bite your hand. And still we carry it, the way a mother would, carefully, from one day to the next. Gorgeous. Well, should we invite Michael Kleber Dix to the screen? Yes. There Let's he is. do that. And I have some <laughs> things to say about Michael <laughs> Kleber Dix. <laughs> so I will do a little, a little bit of intro here, and then we'll get to hear you read your marvelous poems. Let me just see what I've done with my uh, <laughs> papers here. It, I'm a nightmare with a desk. It's just, oh, I can only handle one thing at a time, I think is the issue. But here we are and with Michael in his wonderful cardigan, looking <laughs> dapper. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And I will dive in how lucky we are to have met Michael Cleaver Dix. When we first encountered each other, and this is Michael, me, and James all separately encountered each other, we all knew it would be the beginning of more collaboration and more connection. We just knew. And the, I remember Michael and I emailing each other, like, well, look me up when you're out here. Well, I'll look, well, let me know if you head out there. You know, it was like, we have to keep it going. It's that sense of resonance. And then his poems, his poems. The poems in Michael's first book, Worldly Things, moved me to a place beyond laughter, beyond tears, and to the core of compassion itself. And they still do. Every time I hear him read or every time I open that beautiful book. So please join us in welcoming Michael Kleber Dix. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, I totally felt the same way with both of you. I'm like, 
I can tell that we are going to be friends. <laughs> um, so I have to start with just a very short story. Yeah. Um, when the email came inviting me to be a part of this reading, I was overjoyed when I saw the subject line and then a little crestfallen when I saw the date. Uh, because today is my wife's birthday. I know Sonia Gonzalez, who, who came on earlier, it's her birthday as well. And happy birthday to Sonia and happy birthday to my wife, Karen, who's on with us. And I was thinking, well, before I answer the email, let me check with my wife. Uh, and, you know, would it be all right? Here's the good news. Uh, because I'm with you all tonight, my high honor. We're having a, a dinner gathering to celebrate my wife's birthday tomorrow night. And today, there's a significant snowstorm here that probably would have frustrated our plans for tonight anyway. So it turned out beautifully. Um, I wanted to start, though, with a poem that I wrote uh, for Karen. It's called I'm Sure. I'm Sure. The, the shape our mouths make when we play a brass instrument. I don't know how trumpets work. This wondering woke me into a Saturday with my beloved beside me as she has been for more than a third of my days. A being asleep, so only her head and hair are visible. A wonder I might understand if understanding was possible. I know there are three buttons. I know you can push one of them or any two or none or all. I know when you breathe into it, the horn can make a lot of different notes. So everything else must happen through the lips, the tongue, the lungs, the diaphragm, the body. Happy birthday, Karen. I want to confess that I have a little bit of bah humbug in me, just the tiniest amount, and um, a little bit of Grinch. I sometimes have a hard time embracing the winter spirit. That started to change for me a little bit last year in the pandemic when I started to recognize a value in our rituals. And I started a poem about it around that time, and then this year as I was going through fragments and, and projects that, that were started, I found it again and spent some more time with it and wanted to share it tonight as we gather around the hearth. This is called Evergreen in Wintertime. Discotheque lights, a festive skirt, luminous beings evenly spaced. Pine freshens the air brings the outdoors, indoors, and ornamental memories of our first Christmas. Presents, things we add with years, fragile things, all we have lost, not only objects, light, how darkness surrounds us now our evergreen rituals imbued with new meaning. Green being the color of renewal, we need to water our trees every day. Bring out our candles when the sun goes away. Surrender again and again to the annual joy. There, above the hearth, your favorite cookies in their same tartan box a ritual delight, like all ritual delight, simultaneously expected and surprising. On um, Sunday of this week, the Twin Cities lost a, a beautiful artist and a beautiful man named Bill Cotman. Um, Bill was a photographer and um, a jazz aficionado and just a beloved member of our arts community. Um, Bill was someone who I saw socially at engagements 
many times over the years, we always visited and I was always taken aback by his warmth and kindness, his grace and the gentleness of his presence. Um, tonight, I was just thinking about what I wanted to read. I also like to dwell in uncertainty too, <laughs> like, ah, what's next? But um, I was thinking about it today and wanted to read um, my poem, Conifer's Fathers in Honor of Bill, um, who is, uh, I know to be just a wonderful father and he was a wonderful father and grandfather. And um, I dedicate this to his memory, Conifer's Fathers. Let's fashion gentle fathers, expressive, holding us how we wanted to be held before we could ask. Singing off key lullabies written for us songs every evening like possibilities. Fathers who say, this is how you hold a baby, but never mention a football. Say nothing in that moment, just bring us to their chests naturally without shyness. Let's grow fathers from pine, not oak. Coniferous fathers raising us in their shade, fathers soft enough to bend, fathers who love us like their fathers couldn't, fathers who can talk about menstruation while playing a game of pepper in the front yard. No, take baseball out. Let's discover a new sort. Fathers as varied and vast as the superior forest. Let's kill off sternness and play down wisdom. Give us fathers of laughter and fathers who cry. Fathers who say, check this out. I'm scared. I'm sorry. Or I don't know. Give us fathers strong enough to admit they want to be near us. They've always wanted to be near us. Give us fathers desperate for something different, not Johnny Appleseed, not even Atticus Finch. No more Rolling Stones. No more lazy boy dads reading newspapers in some other room. Let's create folklore side by side in a garden singing psalms about abiding. Just that. Abiding. Being steadfast present, evergreen and ethereal. Let's make the old needles soft enough for us to dream, rest on, dream on, next to them. This is um, a prayer for connection. What name for this? Do you hold salt or beads? Wood or wool? Someone else's hand or your own? Do you kneel? Lift one hand high above your head? Or do you shine the light of your palms up towards sky? Do you raise your chin, close your eyes? Is light returned to you? Do you sit on a floor, shoeless, chant? Do you fold your body gently onto itself, shins to earth, seat to feet, chest to knees? Are you among brothers or sisters? Are you alone sometimes? Do you call it morning light or dawn prayer? Is it the flower offering or do you ask for daily bread? What do you say at dusk, at night? And what do you seek in supplication? What do you offer? Water or fruit, flowers or incense? Do you give your servant self to what?
may I ask? To what? I rest my sit bones on wood and wool. My feet touch carpet, pine, metal. I make circles and lines. Sometimes everything reduces to circles and lines. I call this providence. I know that's not the right word. I find this at home in my kitchen or at my desk. Sometimes this finds me when I'm on a bicycle surrounded by cars or trees, shoulders low and curved, back arched and chest deflated and down and me at work to keep everything round. Sometimes there I hear birds or squirrels chant above me. Other times I am summoned to spaces magnified in community. What name for this? I feel called. I walk forward to say this. This is what I have to offer. One part of my small story. Or this is what I have witnessed. I want you to notice it too. My hands, my grasp, sometimes they only claim air. Sweet siblings, we're here together either way. What name must we give to the this beyond our words? And I'll close with a, a short piece. It's another prayer for community. This is what I write. I write about empathy and community. Um, this just desire for us to be together and to see each other's humanity and to extend to each other grace and dignity and respect and love and patience and kindness and space. Um, work I'm working on myself. I want to say to Danusha and James, thank you so much for including me tonight. I want to say to Karen, thank you so much for giving me the thumbs up on being here tonight um, and for all of your support, always. To Kim, my goodness, chills as you were going into poems that I've known for years and giving me an opportunity to hear them in new ways, um, multiple times, chills and to Jane. I'm so excited to share this space with you. It is a real honor for me and a real blessing. Um, thank you. The Grove. Planted here as we are. See how we want to bow and sway with the motion of earth and sky. Feel how desire vibrates within us as our branches fan out. Promise entanglements rarely touch. Here are sweet rustlings. If only we could know how twisted up our roots are, we might make past shelter together. Cooler places, verdant spaces, more sustaining air. But we are strange trees reluctant in this forest. We oak and ash, we pine the same, the same, not different. All of us reach toward a star and cloud. All of us want our share of light, just enough rainfall. Thank you so, so, so much, Michael. I'm just so thrilled and honored that you could be here uh, tonight. And thanks to Karen. Absolutely. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> thanks to Karen too for helping that happen. So happy birthday, Karen. And thank you for those beautiful poems that are 
continuing to take us deeper into that place where we're just, I think, needing to go right now into those realms of the realms of kindness, right? That's where we want to go. So thank you. And it is our honor to also get to welcome Jane to read next. And I really feel, James, like we're making our own church in that we're getting to <laughs> create a journey that we want to be on, right? Absolutely. I think poetry is church for myself and many of the people that I talk to. So it, it feels like such a great privilege to invite um, the priests and reverends that we love the most into this space with us. That's right. It certainly is. <clears throat> And I know well, I, you have a little intro. I do. I get the honor of uh, introducing Jane. Um, I think most of us know who Jane is by now, um, but I'll just say just personally how Jane and I came to be connected. So years ago, I, I've been engaging and connecting with Jane's poems for quite a while now, but I wrote about one of her pieces for the Times Literary Supplement. And luckily she saw it and through a friend of mine um, wrote and said that she wanted me to have an advanced copy of her newest book, which was Come Thief at the time, one of my favorite books of all time. And, uh, and I was, first of all, amazed that Jane had even seen something that I had written about her poem and was so heartened by the connection. And in the time that I've gotten to know Jane over the years, what I've realized is that her poems of beauty and precision are, of course, what draw us to her and, and her immense presence but it's also her presence among people that matters the most. I, I hear from other writers all the time that, you know, Jane Hirschfield wrote to me about this poem or, or Jane wrote an email to me about this. And, and so Jane serves as such an example to all of us of how to be present, giving in the poetry community and how to uplift the, the work of others at the same time. So we thank you, Jane, for all of the work you've done over the years and that you continue to do for us and, uh, and welcome. Well, thank you so much. It is a tremendous honor and joy to join some of the most generous voices on the landscape today, making community, and making with your words tonight and with your work, uh, reaching outward, forward, backwards in time, building a chapel in which we can sit. So thank you. Um, for my first poem, I wanted to acknowledge, it's an earlier poem, I wanted to acknowledge the time we have all been through together and uh, many of us in this past two years have uh, gone through losses, both private and individual and public and enormous and immense. Uh, this has been a time of so many departures from this world. Uh, people we know, people we don't know. And yet we all sit with that count together. And so I'm going to start with an earlier poem uh, written, uh, I think it was 2004, 2005, after a year in which I had had many losses, losses of my immediate family, losses of senior poets whom I had dearly loved and treasured. And, and this poem um, became the close of a book called After, and it was called After because it was after so many departures. It was like this, you were happy. It was like this, you were happy, then you were sad, then happy again, then not. It went on, you were innocent or you were guilty, actions were taken or not. At times you spoke, at other times you were silent. Mostly it seems you were silent. What could you say? Now it is almost over. Like a lover, your life bends down and kisses 
your life. It does this not in forgiveness, between you there is nothing to forgive, but with the simple nod of a baker at the moment he sees the bread is finished with transformation. Eating too is a thing now only for others. It doesn't matter what they will make of you or your days, they will be wrong. They will miss the wrong woman, miss the wrong man. All the stories they tell will be tales of their own invention. Your story was this. You were happy, then you were sad. You slept, you awakened. Sometimes you ate roasted chestnuts, sometimes persimmons. One more, even earlier poem, much earlier. Um, and after that, I'll be reading you for however many minutes I have left um, uh, all poems that were written during this past year. So not, not published in books. Uh, this poem partakes of a form I sometimes use and think of as wandering rhyme. So it does rhyme, but it's not all that regular. The task. It is a simple garment, this slipped on world. We wake into it daily, open eyes, braid hair, a robe unfurled in rose silk flowering, then laid bare. And yes, it is a simple enough task we've taken on, though also vast. From dusk to dawn, from dawn to dusk to praise, and not be blinded by the praising. To lie like a cat in hot sun, fur fully blazing, and dream the mouse. And to keep, too, the mouse's patient waking watch within the deep rooms of the house, where the leaf-flocked sunlight never reaches, but the earth still blooms. So some of these have uh, not only never been read aloud, but have never been seen by anyone but me. Um, this one included, and if I stumble, it's because they're a little messy. They have corrections on them and such. Um, granted. How much of the world a person keeps taking for granted? Floor under feet that creaks only in certain places, ceiling that keeps on not falling. The moving things too, truck after truck going by on the not so far highway, carrying tin soups and mercy. The whole velocity machinery of it. My life, a person might say, taken for granted too that strangest possession. Roses on a table in winter, zesting a lemon, then washing the grater. Granted, generosity after generosity after generosity hurtling past. Oh, responsibility. You know, responsibility is a big thing, and yet we've all been trying to take it um, for such a long time. Responsibility for what we can't know, can't control, what we perhaps can do one molecule of something about. Oh, responsibility. To one side, Irretrievable spires and cobbles, ladders, arpeggios, bolites, apples, oysters, cities and languages lost under sand. To the other, what can be wrestled with still, reconnoitered, returned to, repaired. Oh, responsibility tied to the feast of your stanchion like a tired donkey. 
with commensurate ears, one could hear the old music in it. Some June singing thrush or distant one stringed instrument made of maple wood, rabbit skin, horsehair. Neither separate from nor completing the cries of the famished. I asked to be lush, to be green. I pressed myself to the clear glass between wanting and world. I wanted to be lush, tropical, excessive, to be green on the glass that does not exist, small breath clouds rose, dissolved. A creature of water, I found myself, tender, still also of air. The dry bark of trees sequestered the hidden rising. I told my want, patience. I offered my want, the old promise, a tree not wet to the touch is wet to the living. Other people have said they were reading uh, short poems. I am reading a short poem now, um, Vestment. For the pear, for the fig, no difference. They ripen even in Ashfall. We, of course, uh, live in a time and Danusha and I in a place of fire. And it is very true. The ash falls and falls and the fruit ripens and ripens. So I don't have that much time left. Um, uh, this one some of you may have seen because it appeared in a magazine uh, that some people see. Tin. I studied much and remembered little, but the world is generous. It kept offering figs and cheeses. Never mind that soon I'll have to give it all back, the world, the figs, to be a train station of existence is no small matter. It doesn't need to be Grand Central or Hyder Pasha Station. The engine shed could be low, windowed with cold dust under a slat shingled roof. It could be tin, another mystery bandaged with rivets and rubies, leaking cold and heat in both directions as the earth does. Invitation. It was not given me to write in the primary colors. I did not recognize the 350,000 species of beetle. I loved what was spare, but could not draw it. My luck and errors equally mostly escaped me. My eyes faltered, but found their way to different windows. The fate souk bartered my shapes and sounds between stalls. When the keyboard offered me an incomprehensible symbol, I reached my hand out as if to a Ouija board's invitation or a stairs polished handrail. Because it was incomprehensible, because my hand could add its own oils to that railing. So I think I have time for only one more. This is also one you may have seen because um, James kindly um, put it up on his amazing Sunday poem feature on Guarlingo. I would like. 
I would like my living to inhabit me the way rain, sun, and their wanting inhabit a fig or apple. I would like to meet it also in pieces scattered, a conversation set down on a long hallway table, a disappointment pocketed inside a jacket, some long ago irritation glimpsed half recognized in the corner of a thrift store painting. To discover my happiness walking first toward, then away from me, down a stairwell, on two strong legs all its own. Also, the uncountable wheat stalks, how many times broken, beaten, before entering the marriage of oven and bread. Let me find my life in that too. In my moments of clumsiness, solitude, in days of vertigo and hesitation, in the many year ends that found me standing on top of a stovetop to take down a track light. In my nights asked, sometimes answered, questions. I would like to add to my life, while we are still living, a little salt and butter, one more slice of the edible apple, a teaspoon of jam from the long simmered fig. To taste as if something tasted for the first time what we will have become then. Thank you all very much for being here together by this hearth. Thank you, thank you, thank you is not even enough. Thank you so much, Jane. And I'm so grateful to have a job where I can cry and feel <laughs> and be um, just so much beauty and impermanence. In what you shared. Yeah, such sumptuous poems, you know, so filled with the things of the world. I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Even I feel the great insecurity of, of you know, reading new work is just terrifying. It, yeah. it, it never stops being terrifying, no matter how many times you've done it. Um, so thank you for being many of these poems first years. <laughs> I, that's reassuring, I think, to many people mm -hmm. that you feel that way. And of course, and in a way, that's that newness as well, isn't it? The freshness of fresh fear or fresh joy. <laughs> They're both <laughs> just so fresh fear, newly harvested. <laughs> that's right. Along with those apples and figs. <laughs> That trepidation. We want to be a little afraid, right? That we're that little bit of fear. Yeah. Every soup pot needs a little fear in its seasoning, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> like peppercorn. <laughs> Just like peppercorn. <laughs> so we get to savor that too, right? We get to savor that too together, that risk. And I, I say that because I, I think it's so important for, for those of us reaching out to write and to uh, attempt whatever it is we're attempting maybe it's riding a horse um to embrace that bit of fear i certainly have it a lot <laughs> um and keep going anyways most of the time so yeah thanks for bringing the fear into the room too <laughs> my privilege <laughs> i'm going to mute now yes okay <laughs> Well, that brings us toward our close for tonight of this particular gathering. And we are so grateful to you all for being with us. And we wanted to have a little time at the end in case there were questions or things. Oh, I see there are 52 new messages since I've checked the chat. So I'm just going to take a moment to look at that. I think Corel has posted links to books. Worldly Things for Michael. I don't know if they're all in there. I'm scrolling through. Yes, they are. Okay. So if you're interested in books and we'd like to support an independent bookstore, which is Bookshop Santa Cruz, our local wonderful bookstore, um, 
there are books for all of us listed there. Ledger for Jane and Worldly Things for Michael. And for James, there's a link to a page that has, I think, a couple of them because we have anthologies to look at too, like How to Love the World. And then my book, Bonfire Opera, it looks like. So, and then Kim's, um, Saved by a Poem, which is another wonderful read about what it is to commit poems to heart. Um, for those of you who have thought about doing that or would like to maybe attempt that fearfully or otherwise. Um, so those are there for you. And I think, um, James, did you want to share a bit about upcoming? Sure. So I think we, we have a graphic to go along with it, but we have a couple of upcoming offerings. And um, the first of those is the Voices of Nature Poetry of Resilience webinar that Danusha and I offer throughout the year. And um, you can see some of the wonderful writers that will be with us, including Mark Nepo, Naomi Shihab Nye, Ida Limon, Kimberly Blazer, Cole Brown, Camille Dungy. So just some wonderful writers. And uh, you can find more out about that by going to the link there or uh, messaging one of us on social media or something like that. And then the next offering um, is actually going to be at the end of January. And um, that's going to be a gentle beginnings, uh, self-compassion retreat. So Danusha and I will be sharing poetry. And then these other wonderful folks will be sharing just some different self-compassion practices, movement, music, and um, some yoga as well, I think. So we'll be a part of that. And that's um, a two-day retreat, very reasonably priced. And um, I should mention too with our webinar, if you need uh, any sort of scholarship or anything like that, please just um, let our support person know, email that address on the website and we can make that happen for you. Yes, thank you. And thanks for sh the screen share, Carol, for those upcoming things. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you. And thanks, Carol, for being behind the scenes. Carol is the events coordinator for Bookshop Santa Cruz, and she's here helping us and supporting us and being in this space tonight. Thank you. Um, so yes, thank you so much. This was our first Hearth and Fire gathering, and we hope to do these a couple or a few times a year. And again, we're deeply grateful to our readers tonight. And I'm just going to scroll quickly and see if there was a question or two. I don't think there are. Usually we're in such an altered state after these things. Um, I know I am. So I'm going to go like finish my tea and just. <laughs> marinate, marinate. marinate. Wow. Yeah. Nisha, there was a question about the event recording and that's going to be sent out tomorrow for oh. everyone, right? Great. So yes, um, Michelle, who's our usual support person, will package that up and send it around to, because we have your emails since you are registered, and she will send that around so you can watch it later or for those who are unable to be here in real time with us. So yes, uh, let's, can you let people unmute if they want to um, from the other end, Carol, just so yes. we can say hellos Absolutely. and goodbyes, and that would be great. For a lovely evening. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for coming and for, um, you know, to the birthday girl there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank just, you. Just Thank beautiful. You. Thank you so much. Thanks, Michelle. Oh, it's so good to see all your faces. It's really sweet. Um, the small pleasures of life, right? Since we are Yes. more apart than together uh it's a small pleasure but it's a, certainly a pleasure just to get to see our tiny faces on here so thank you honored to be here for the first time thank you so much oh wonderful was that kimberly or no that That's was marcy marcy there we are marcy there you are you. <laughs> i had just changed uh screen thank you marcy Thank you. I just want to thank every one of you and including everyone that shared space sitting and listening. That was also felt around the world. I wanted to thank you all presenters, poets, for just widening the light across the globe and inviting us. Thank you. Thanks, Hoffi. <laughs> Nika and I call each other Hoffi because when we became friends, we just read Hoffa's poems to each other. <laughs> and somehow we ended up just calling each other Hoffy, like a nickname <laughs> from office. So, <laughs> an unusual origin story. Or maybe not. Maybe that's happening all the time. <laughs> <laughs>
I like to think so. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you, Heather Swan. Thank Thanks you, Heather. For being here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Love to all of you. Thank oh, you. beautiful people. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So good to see Take you. Care. Hi, Anne. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for holding this space together. Even though we're not in one place, I have found that even writing with a few friends, which I've done with students, I've done it really. While I give them an exercise, I write too sometimes. And I get, uh, I don't know, the poems feel closer when I'm with them, even if it's at this kind of distance. Mm. What did Einstein call it? Well, it wasn't referring to this, but spooky action at a distance. <laughs> I just, that's one of my favorite terms, even though it refers to something else. <laughs> that's how I like to use it. So thank you all. And we hope to see more of you at other Hearth and Fire events. And if you're interested in um, those other offerings, you know, contact us as well. Right soon. So much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.